Hello everybody, uh, my name is Akshay and I am here to talk about monitoring and managing security vulnerabilities in open source software. Uh, the topics I am going to be covering is what exactly is a CVE, how do you go about monitoring and fixing CVEs and just um, the quality of the CVE data it's, um, uh, or uh, covering statistics about the quality of CVE data and the tools and its shortcomings. And lastly, I'm going to cover security best practices to keep your product secure. And if not anything else, um, there are a lot of memes, so you can have a laugh at those. So what is a CVE? Um, CV stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposure. And whenever a security researcher or a developer finds a software bug which has a security impact, what they do is they notify an organization like MITRE and that organization keeps track of this in a public um, record or a database where they enter the vulnerability information in that database. And it gets tracked uniquely. Um, however, if a developer s treats that bug as a functional issue and does not evaluate the security impact, in that case, it would get um, silently fixed as a regular issue and it might not make it to the CVE list or CVE database. Um, so your product might still be vulnerable from a security standpoint of view, um, but it's not tracked as a vulnerability from a CV dictionary standpoint of view. And then there is a whole um, bunch of undiscovered vulnerabilities um, which get discovered over time. Uh, might be zero day exploits or might um, just be uh, caught through fuzzing tools or um, static analysis tools. So now that you know the different types of vulnerabilities, um, how do you go about monitoring them? So if you just take CV data, um, then you, there are open source tools which can be used to monitor the CV, CVEs in a product. Um, however, there are a lot of missed CVEs because of various issues with the quality of the CVE data, which we're going to discuss in the upcoming slides. Um, and the effort involved in monitoring using open source tools is quite minimal. But at the same time, because of the missed CVEs, your product might not be secure then you can combine those tools along with some manual analysis of CVEs. And in doing so, um, you can improve the security of your product, but the effort required is much more. So this covers CVEs. If you want to track all the silent bug fixes, which have security impact as well, in that case, you might want to look at the security bulletins, issue trackers, change logs of new releases of software and see what got fixed in the latest version of software. And then evaluate if it might have potential security impact yourself. And if you want to go into the undiscovered vulnerabilities, then you can run static analysis tools or fuzzers yourself and then discover them. And there are commercial tools available to help reduce the effort, but depending on the tool, it may or may not like help secure your product. Um, so you'll have to evaluate the tool on a case-by-case -case basis before uh, starting to use them. And why exactly is monitoring CVs a challenge? So if you take a look at the year-over-year -year data of the 
number of CVs being reported. So it has been constantly growing. And in 2018, there were more than 16,000 vulnerabilities which were reported. So if you had to manually analyze each of these CVs, then it's a big challenge. Um, so how do we monitor CVs? So before going into the details of monitoring CVs, I want to just briefly talk about what is the uh, what are the contents of a CV? The first one is like a CV ID, which is a unique number, a unique ID given to the vulnerability. Uh, then there's the description of the vulnerability, and NIST adds some additional metrics such as how severe the vulnerability is, and that depends on is it easily exploitable and what is the impact if somebody does exploit it? So it's a score between like zero to 10. Um, you have low, um, medium, high, and critical uh, severity. There's also a attack vector field, which means that do you need to be physically present at the device, or do you need to be like a local user on the device to exploit um, the vulnerability, or can you do it remotely through the network? Um, it also has information whether like user in interaction is required or not. Um, and the last key piece of information, which is also encoded, is something called as CPE, which stands for Common Platform Enumeration. And what this is is like um, it has information as to what the product is for example, like OpenSSL, and who the vendor is, and which versions of software is affected. So it could be a range, it could be a single version. And this is a key piece because if you're using tools to automate monitoring CVEs, then this is the information the tools would look at to figure out if your product is, uh, or if the version of software you're using is vulnerable or not. So having talked about the contents of a CVE, um, so how do we go about monitoring it? So since like Ubuntu and Debian distros uh, have been successful in monitoring security vulnerabilities and fixing them in a timely fashion, so if you consider their model, um, what they kind of do is they manually review every CVE in the CVE feed um, and then see whether it's applicable to their product. And if it is applicable to their product, they go ahead and then like patch it, issue security advisories. And not only do they do that, they also monitor release notes. Whenever a new version of software is released, um, they subscribe to various security mailing lists um, and then uh, appropriately in a timely fashion fix vulnerabilities. And if you as an embedded developer uh, are trying to mimic that model, it's not feasible unless you have a dedicated cybersecurity team. That's, and the reason being there are more than 16,000 uh, known vulnerabilities which are uh, reported on a yearly basis, which translates to more than 300 CVs weekly. And you're also responsible for delivering features in a timely fashion. Um, so it's not a practical model. Um, so what are some of the other options? Uh, if you were to do it yourself, uh, the first step is to gather a list of um, software running on the device along with the version, associated version with it. Once you have that list, what you can do is look at the NVD feed, which is public, or uh, go to the NVD website and then like um, enter that information there. And that's gonna give you a list of CVEs. Um, and for that particular version of software. And once you have that list of CVEs, then you can see whether they're really applicable to your product or not. For example, you might not be using a certain kernel feature in which case, if a CVE is against like the floppy driver and you're not using like a floppy, 
um, in your product, then you can safely ignore that. So you'd go, uh, you would analyze each of those CVs, triage them, and make a shorter list as to which ones need to be fixed. Or some of them might not be important based on like how your product is configured. Um, so that constitutes the monitoring portion of CVEs. This is the website which I was talking about. Uh, so you can go in there, uh, enter the vendor and product information. It also has an option for entering the version information. You do that, hit search, and it's going to give you a list of CVs for that particular product and version. And if you're coming from a build system such as Yocto, uh, Yocto has this capability called um, CV check class. All you have to do is inherit this class in your local.conf and run your regular bit bake command to build. And when you, at the end of the build, it gives you a report which contains a summary of all the CVEs in your build. Um, the only downside is the way it stands right now, both host and host in the sense like native packages and target packages, CVEs are all munched together and it's a giant list. So you'll have to sift through it, which is cumbersome. So now you have different ways in which you get a list of CVEs. What do you do with that list? The first thing is you need to prioritize which CVs need to be fixed. Ideally, if you upgrade to the latest and greatest version of all the versions of software you have, you should get all the CV, most of the CV fixes automatically. Um, but it might not be practical in that case. So what you do is apply various levels of filtering. So like how I mentioned that if you're not using um, certain kernel features, the CVs might not be applicable uh, to you. So you, you can go through the list. So for example, here's a example CV list based on uh, IMX Rocco release, which is roughly two years old, I think, at this point. Uh, it had, by default, 658 CVs, out of which 339 were kernel CVs. Up, after applying the kernel config filter, it dropped down to like 432. Now, if you want to concentrate just on the high and critical uh, CVSS core based CVEs, then it, it further drops down to 239 CVEs. And most embedded devices, you don't have like local users logging into the device and interacting with the devices. So you could probably safely ignore those and look at the network attack vectors, uh, so which ones can be remotely exploited. So, once applying that filter, you'd f you further drop down to like 158 CVEs. At this point, I would recommend going and fixing all of those, but if you're in a time crunch, um, you can also look at which ones have public exploits. So typically, references for public exploits are also available in the NVD feed, or you can look at like a website called ExploitDB, so see which, which CVEs have exploits and prioritize those, because those are the ones which most likely hackers would first target. So now that you have like a prioritized list of which CVs you plan on fixing, how do you go about patching them? Um, one option is to see if the latest version of software already fixes it. In case it does, upgrade to the latest version. Otherwise, um, look at the reference links in NVD to see what is the commit ID or what, where, where does the patch reside for that CVE and then backport it yourself. Um, you can also look at commit logs from upstream packages. Um, typically, people do tag uh, CV information in those as well. And if you do backport them, then you might have to maintain patches because um, there might be the number of CVs over time keep growing, and you might, if you continue to backport other CV fixes, there might be conflicts as well, um, which might not cleanly apply. So you might have, 
you might be on the hook for maintaining them as well if you don't, do not upgrade the software. Um, talking more about like upgrading the software versus backporting, um, first question you get asked is why don't you just upgrade to the latest software? Most time, like there are API changes, especially in user space components. And that means you might have to change your application. And if you're using like third party applications, you might be stuck with older versions because the third party application uh, might be slow to make those API changes which your user application depends on. There might be license changes as well. Uh, so you might end up backporting, which is complex. Uh, but if you do do the backporting, then uh, if there is a public exploit available, just run that, make sure uh, the backport is uh, cleanly done, such that the exploit uh, is not able to um, uh, such that the vulnerability is addressed uh, with the backport. You can also run uh, package tests in Yocto to make sure there are no regression related issues um, and make sure the backport is good. The last aspect is the practicality of addressing CVEs in the Linux kernel. If you consider the Linux kernel, um, there is one release every five days um, or so for the LTS branches, which is good, which means it's getting all the bug fixes and the CVE fixes um, into the LTS branches. Um, on an average, there's like one to two CVEs fixed, but at the same time, it means that you need to continuously upgrade and run tests. And many times, product test cycles are greater than five days. Um, so how do you keep up? Um, so this is where like, uh, having like a monthly release cadence or when sufficient number of like uh, high or critical CVs get accumulated, uh, then immediately jumping to the latest minor LTS release might make sense. Um, and the kernel config filtering will definitely help um, because if the CVs don't affect you, then you, don't, you might not need to upgrade. The other major thing which determines how many CVs are there in your product is the number of packages in your product and how old your release is. Uh, so if you take, again, Yocto as an example, if you're running like core image minimal, even a two and a half year old uh, Morty release of Yocto just has 33 CVs. And the master branch has like just four CVs. Whereas if you consider core image SATO, which in includes a lot of graphic libraries and various other packages, it has 336 CVs just from a user space standpoint of view. And this does not include any kernel CVs. Whereas the master branch contains 14. So Periodically updating to the latest version of Yocto makes sense, especially if you have a large number of packages. And it's also um, crucial that if you're not using certain packages, get rid of it, reduce your uh, attack surface from a security standpoint of view. So now that you know how to monitor and patch CVEs, the next step is the real issue with CVEs, is the quality of data in the NVD database. So there are various issues. Uh, the first one being like inconsistent naming. So if you consider a package like ARM Trusted Firmware, uh, there are CVEs listed in NVD database against ARM hyphen trusted firmware, ARM underscore trusted firmware, trusted underscore firmware dash a. So if you did not know to look for all those three products, you would miss CVs against that particular package. Uh, there are other issues where there are typos. For example, 2.23 might be listed as 2.2.3 in the CPE information, in which case uh, your automated tool would never catch that and report that CVE, leading to, leading to a missed CVE. There might be typos in names as well. Um, and sometimes there's incomplete analysis. So for example, 
they may say all versions up to the latest version of software is affected because that's the easiest thing to do instead of figuring out which commit actually introduced the CVE. And in doing so, it will result in false positives. So if you are on the older version of software which is not affected, you might still be, um, your tool might still be flagging that package as having a CVE. On the flip side, sometimes um, there are entries saying only the latest version of software is affected, whereas the prior versions of software also are affected. Um, and lastly, there is the issue of no uh, CPE information or no version information leading to missed CVEs. So how do you address some of these issues? Yocto has solutions for some of these. So for example, um, you can specify a CVE product and what that means is you have your Yocto recipe name and that needs to map to the NVD um, name for, that, for a particular uh, CVE. So for curl, uh, CV might be listed against curl or lib curl. So by specifying, by specifying a CV product saying like curl space lib curl is going to search for CVs against both of those in the NVD database. So this will reduce the number of missed CVs. Um, if there is, if the Yocto recipe versioning uh, scheme is different from what's in NVD, you can also have a CV underscore version, which will help you do the mapping between um, Yocto to NVD. Lastly, the Yocto community itself is pretty good at backporting CV fixes. And when they do that, they tag that information in the patch headers or in the file name itself. Um, so the CV check class looks for the patch headers and or the CV ID in the file name uh, to see whether a CV is fixed. This way, you don't uh, have to look at CVs which are already fixed, which helps you save time. All these solutions are good, but it totally depends on which version of Yocto you're on. So taking CV product as an example, if you consider the Marty release, which was like two years back against Watts Warrior, there's 22 entries for CV product which is missing. So nobody backported those um, CV products to Marty. Um, so 22 might look like a small number, but it means that 22 of the packages are not being tracked for CVEs. And that translates to 151 CVEs which are missed, out of which 96 of them were high or critical. So you need to consider that when you use the CV check tool in Yocto. And this is just including Pokey, um, not even talking about the hundreds of other meta layers out there. I haven't an analyzed those, I've just analyzed Pokey, and that's the data from that. Um, the, other, the other aspect of it is the tools themselves constantly improve. And recently, Yocto moved from CV check tool to something called CV update database, and that's only in the master branch. And what that does is it moves from like a XML feed, which used to do like a string comparison to using the JSON feed and doing logical comparison, like greater than or equal to or less than or equal to for version numbers. And just taking three recipes as an example, for the same version of the package, with the old scheme and new scheme, there's like 10 new CVs which are being reported. Um, and that's only in master branch. So unless these patches have been backported to previous versions, you might be missing a lot of CVs because of that. Um, and as the tools improve, um, you get a lot less missed CVs, but at the same time, it exposes some of the other issues with the quality of data in NVD, leading to more false positives. Um, so that's at least been my experience uh, using that. 
Um, so how do we improve the NVD feed um, data quality? So first thing is, if you see something uh, which is inconsistent or inaccurate, just send an email to nvd at nist.gov. My personal experience is within an hour, they update it and their website is updated, the feeds are updated, and it fixes the issue for everybody. So everybody doesn't have to keep looking at the same CV saying like, oh, this is bad data and continuing to ignore them. So that's the least you can do. Um, if you see any discrepancies in the CV summary or uh, references, uh, you can submit, uh, in, submit that information to Miter. And if you see CV product which is being missed for a particular recipe, submit a Yocto patch. Or if you want to improve the tools yourself, you can do that as well. Um, so there's also another issue with the CV data quality that's mainly for the Linux kernel. So whenever a CV is being reported against the Linux kernel, what NVD does is like they analyze that and then um, report it against all versions up to like the latest version, let's say 5.2 for example. Um, then the kernel maintainers um, propose a fix, mainline it, and then the community or the stable kernel maintainers go ahead and then backport those fixes to all the LTS branches. However, uh, NIST does not go ahead and then like reanalyze this, these CVs to say, okay, this fix was backported um, and they don't update the NVD database for it. This results in a lot of false positives. Just taking 4.4 as an example, um, if you query the 44184 kernel, there are more than 400 CVs being reported, out of which 415 of them are false positives. So just waste all your time looking at these saying, oh, okay, these are not applicable to me because I'm on like the latest LTS release of 4.4 kernel. Um, so those are all uh, problems with the quality of data. Then there is another aspect, which is the delay in reporting the CVE data itself. Um, so it can vastly vary. So taking two of the CVs as an example, uh, the process is the security reporter goes back and forth with the maintainer in private. Um, the, after a fix has been developed, then what happens is um, the maintainer either discloses it on a public list, like OSS security. If you're not subscribed to it, I would recommend subscribing to it. Um, that's where most of the CVs do get reported. Um, or else uh, it might get reported on a private list like distros um, where it goes through a seven day um, embargo period um, where Linux distributions can uh, patch it uh, so that they don't have to scramble on the day when the CV is made public. Um, and then once the CV does go public, um, NVD, um, the CV starts showing up on NVD. And after a few days, NVD analyzes that CV, uh, the CV is analyzed and the NVD entry is uh, updated to add the CPE information. Um, and if your automated tools rely on the CPE information, it's not gonna report the CV until this initial analysis is done. Um, so it could be up to like, for example, in this case, 68 days um, before your tool starts reporting that CV against your version of software. Um, here's some fun stats. Um, so from when NVD publishes the data to when the initial analysis is done, which is when, when the CPE entry is added, um, it could be in 2017, the average delay was 11 days. 2018, it went up to 34. And then 2019, it went back to 10. So it varies quite a bit there. Um, and there's also another uh, interesting thing where sometimes I talked about these silent bug fixes where um, a bug gets fixed 
and years later, somebody looks at that and says, hey, this had a security impact, and then goes ahead and then requests uh, MITRE to issue a CV against that. So uh, there's an example for a CV from 2019, which was actually fixed in the kernel in 2016. So three years later, somebody requested for a CV for it, and um, it got assigned. So Red Hat, for example, tracks such information where when a vulnerability was actually made public. So if you consider that um, with a grain of salt, like uh, for a limited number of set of packages, the average delays were like roughly like 101 in 2007, um, and it's down to 25 in 2019. So next time when you see a CV in the news, and you're wondering why your uh, tool is not reporting that CV, that's probably because the delays in the uh, CP information being added in the NVD database. Um, so how do you mitigate some of these? So most of these CVs are already being analyzed by Ubuntu, Debian, Red Hat, and most of them have public trackers available. So um, if you can write scripts which can aggregate that information from Ubuntu and Debian, um, then you could leverage or uh, reuse some of that information to report the CVs in a more early fashion for yourself. Um, and Ubuntu also has commit IDs as to which um, see, uh, which commit fixes a particular CV and which one introduced it. Uh, so the civil infrastructure platform uses that to reduce the number of false positives in the CIP kernel. Um, so another aspect which I wanted to talk about was secure boot. So many of our customers implement secure boot, chain of trust, and then just forget about it, thinking their product is secure. Um, but if you go back and look at CVs affecting, let's say, the processor itself, uh, for example, the IMX processor had few CVs related to secure boot, in which it would allow unauthorized code to run um, because of a buffer overflow issue in the checking of the signature. Um, ARM trusted firmware, Opti, which are secure world operating system code, also have multiple CVs reported against them. So it's not enough to just initially design secure boot. Um, as part of development, you also need to continuously monitor for CVs against those. Um, and it's not just software which are assigned CVs. It's also like processors and processor firmware. Uh, so if you look at the Snapdragon 410 processor and look at how many CVs are there, there's like 246 CVs uh, reported against the processor and the firmware, binary blobs as well. Um, so you need to look at those um, and manage those if, because those are typically not included in your build system like Yocto. Um, So given all the challenges with monitoring CVs, what is a good strategy? Um, my recommendation is it's a twofold approach. One is during the design of the product, um, bake in security. And what that means is whether you're locking down hardware by um, disabling the serial console, disabling JTAG, implementing secure boot, chain of trust, um, implementing access control, like SE Linux or AppArmor. Um, and then the other key aspect is having a secure firmware update mechanism, uh, such that when you do discover CVs, you can go ahead and then securely deploy new versions of software. Um, reduce the attack surface by reducing the number of um, unused components. Uh, and the next aspect is staying secure. 
which is periodically updating your software versions, managing uh, vulnerabilities, uh, monitoring them, and then uh, patching vulnerabilities. Um, also having some sort of audit log um, and monitoring that as well. So from a tool standpoint of view, if you're evaluating any commercial tools uh, or if you're trying to improve the existing open source tools themselves, uh, here are some of the wish lists such that the effort involved in monitoring CVs can be reduced. You know, one thing I talked about was kernel config-based filtering. So you can go ahead and then like um, have some kind of CV to kernel config mapping so that you don't have to uh, look at those CVs if they're not applicable. Um, having ability to add like um, notes for a particular CV, uh, collaborate, team collaboration, like sharing. Um, another thing is like right now with the Octo, whenever you run a rescan of the uh, CV, um, you don't get a comparison report. Um, so you have to manually diff the results and figure out which ones are new, which ones are already uh, addressed, so on. Um, and the other aspect is, are there multiple sources other than NVD being used uh, to mitigate the delays in NVD updating the database. So if you want to see some of these features in action, top, uh, stop by the Timesys booth or check out this particular link. Um, we have a tool which can help with some of these things. Um, so to wrap most of these things up, the key takeaway is there is no magic bullet in um, managing and monitoring CVEs here. So you need to design security in from the get-go, allow for firmware upgrades, uh, continuously monitor mailing lists, um, triage them, uh, triage the vulnerabilities, uh, patch and update to the latest version of software. Um, try and automate it wherever it's possible but just be aware of the more you automate um, because of the quality of the NVD data being bad, you might result with missed CVs and false positives as well. Um, and whenever you do see such quality issues, go ahead and then improve the database by sending an email to NIST um, or uh, submitting Yocto patches for the tools. And if your product does not have security, please don't connect it on the internet. Um, that's it. Uh, any questions? Fido, uh, that's like more than four years old at this point, I think. Uh, well, there's a reason I asked this. So my company has a product that is in the field based on Fido. Okay. Uh, and so it would be useful for us. Um, so I don't think I can answer that off the top of my head, um, but I think um, it should be fairly okay because uh, the tool itself is like natively compiled uh, and doesn't have too many dependencies uh, other than like Python and URL lib3, I think. Uh, so it should be possible to backport, uh, but it, FIDO is not actively maintained, so nobody's gonna do it. So you'd have to probably do it yourself. And if you do, you can contribute back uh, if they accept those patches. Any other questions? No? Okay, uh, thanks everyone.